turn to the book of the Revelation, chapter 7 again. And I will <clears throat> briefly review, bring us up to speed as to where I left off last Sunday. Revelation chapter 7, uh, let me just read these two verses, 13 and 14. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, and let me just stop. Notice that even John, with all the revelation he'd received up, up to this point, did not rely upon himself. You know, I just have an inkling that John, John probably knew who this was, but he just wanted to make sure. You know. And I just need to point that out. And he said, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. And that's not really the point of my message. It wasn't the point of my message last Sunday. It's not my point of the message this morning. Here's the point. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Now we will try to briefly review and then bring us back up to where we left off. And I'll do that by saying this. Christ's blood redemption. And blood redemption is done. Yes, sir. He is not redeeming us by his blood. He has redeemed us Amen. by his blood. Christ's blood redemption is not an end in itself. Do you understand that? Sure. Because if it were, that was all would have ever had to have been done. Exactly. Blood redemption is not an end in itself. It is the foundation and the fountain of all. It is the judicial grounds, yes. the basis, and the securing of all things that would accomplish salvation. Because even here we read they've washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Do you see that? They did this. They did this. And remember, this is not about human ability. This is about God, Almighty, God Almighty's grace. And God's people conscientiously, knowingly, lovingly, desiringly, and diligently seek the redemption that is in Christ Jesus even though it's a past thing, judicially. That's right. Now, that's where we started. Now here's where we're going to wind up at. Same, same similar, or similar thing, I should say. Revelation chapter 12. It's talking about Satan here. And it says in verse 11, And they overcame him. It's talking about Satan. Yeah. They overcame him, how? By the blood of the Lamb. Amen. But then notice what else it adds here. And by the word of their testimony. Yes, sir. And not only that. And they love not their lives, not unto death. Because look at the context. These people do not die. They are protected by God in the wilderness for three and a half years. Yes, sir. You see that? But they love not their lives unto the death. That is, for them, they would have this testimony based upon the blood of Jesus Christ yes. unto their dying day. Exactly. Whatever it is. Yes. Whatever it is. So now to come back up to speed. We made it to chapter 8. This is the context. And this is my fourth point that I was making. I started, I ended with this. The trumpets now sound. You see that in chapter 8, verse 1, all the way through chapter 11, verse 19. There is sequence here. This is not parallelism. That is, there are those who say that all of these things, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls, or vials, as the KJ puts it, may all come parallel. They're happening all at the same time. You can't read this and say that if you read it contextually. That does not mean there's not some overlap. Okay? But they're not parallelism. Because one thing or one group of things leads into another. And you see, you can see that if you read it. You don't need me to tell you that. You don't actually need me to tell you anything. I'm just here to reinforce what the Word of God already has said. And you can understand it just as well as I can. 
and I say this metaphorically, away with those who think that you need them to tell you what God's word means. Because yeah. you don't. Exactly. If you have the spirit of God, it's the same spirit I have. The, any understanding I have this word is by the spirit of God. If you have that spirit, you can understand the same thing by that spirit without me. I'm not here to give you understanding. I'm not here to enlighten you. I'm here to simply declare, thus saith the Lord. And if his spirit is in you, then you will see, thus saith the Lord. Exactly. So then, first of all here, this trumpets. Remember, we looked at this. God's people pray for the continued wrath of God upon this earth. You see that in chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Yes, sir. And this is actually an answer to the prayers of the people of God that you've seen under the, what was it, the fifth seal when it was opened. Secondly, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I do want to get to that chapter 12. The trumpets sound, or they begin to sound, I could say. Judgments fall, that is, judgments begin to fall separate, different Distinct, although there may be overlaps, separate judgments begin to fall which, with each sound of the trumpet. Yes, sir. And within this, we have, have three interludes of woe. Yeah. That's what it says. Yeah. Then there are seven thundered voices, which John then is forbidden to record what they said. Yes, sir. Somebody said, well, what, is it, what do they mean? What, what was they? I don't know. Exactly. And anybody who says they do are liars exactly. because John was told he was forbidden do not write down what they said. Exactly. So anybody tells you they know what he said, they're liars. So John's forbidden to record the seven thundered voices. And the two witnesses then are murdered in Jerusalem and raised by God visibly then ascending up to heaven before their murderers. Why do I say that? Because that's what it actually says. With then the seventh trumpet introducing God's people praising him for his eternity, for his sovereignty, for his wrath, for his final judgment, and the reward of his people. That's all in chapter 8 verse 7 all the way through chapter 11 verse 19 and you can read this great cry of God's people in chapters 11 verses 15 through 19 I'm not going to back to read it but God's people then in other words begin to praise him for all that he is yes sir God's people don't pick and choose what they want to believe about God exactly they believe what God has said about himself yeah whether they can meld it together and make it all continuity or not. Yeah, exactly. They know he is continuity. Amen. The fact is we praise him for all he is. That's a part of what it means to be a believer. Yes, sir. We praise God for all that he is. We thank God for all that he is. And we trust God in all that he is. Amen. If he condemns someone, he's right. Yes, sir. He's absolutely right. Let me go even further. If he purposed to condemn someone, yeah. he is absolutely right. Now, go on with context. Now, John sees what is in the context, the tail end of the seven trumpets. That then is seen in chapter 12, verses 1, all the way through chapter 14 and verse 20. But we will look only at chapter 12. So what I'm saying is the seven trumpets, that which is associated directly with the trumpets, seven trumpets, goes all the way up to chapter 14. But what I want to concentrate on is chapter 12, but basically concentrate upon this. And they overcame him, how? By the blood of the Lamb. Yes. But that's not all. Exactly. And by the word of their testimony, that's a second thing, but yet related. The second one is based upon the first one. Exactly. The second one is, uh, the first one is what gives validity to the second one. Yeah. The second one is about the first one. Yes, sir. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And, here's a third one, yeah. and loved not their lives unto the death. That is not just a reality for that day to come. That is a reality today. It's always been a reality for every one of God's people. Amen. And you see it manifest in the first group of inhabitants <laughs> after the fall. What happens? Abel stood up and gave the word of his testimony and it cost him his life. Yes, 
Yes, sir. From who? From his own brother. Amen. Now remember that as we go through this. So then, chapter 12. <laughs> Four things, three things I want to give you about chapter 12 before we get to the crux, the, the highlighted passage that I've cited here. First of all, John sees what was even for him the past. Yeah. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. I'm not even going to read it. You go back and read it. It's all on tape. Yep. If you want to look at these things personally in your own study, you can go back and read them. This is an outline of the context. Verses 1 through 5 is John seeing what was even for him the past. Yep. Then John sees what is even for us the future. Right. John tw uh, Revelation 12, verses 6, 6 through 17. Now here's the point of this. The first five verses sets the scene for and describes the spirit of that which motivates the enemy of God and his people described in verses 6 through 17. That is, the past, this spirit of even what was past is what will still be motivating what will take place even in our future. Yes, sir. Do you get that? That's it. You understand what I'm saying there? Now... Let me explain. This is the third point. The woman here in this, and I hope, some, I hope you've actually read some of this. I mean, I hope you've actually, through this series, that you've actually read some of these things. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not, that, I'm not even going there. This woman is Israel. Yeah. And the great red, red dragon is Satan. Yeah. But here's the lesson to that. Being Israel is more than being an Israelite. Yes, sir. Even according to the Apostle Paul, and it's something that Paul drew from, this truth, I'm, this verse I'm going to quote or, or, or mention, Paul is drawing this truth from Paul's past. Yes, sir. It's not something that became a reality in Paul's day. It's something that had always been the reality as far as Israel was concerned. That's right. And here it is. Being Israel is more than being Israelite. It is being an elect Israelite. Amen. Amen. Right. Romans 9, verse 6. You know, the, you know the verse. They are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And it's actually self-explanatory, but the context basically is this. Just because a person is of Israelite, we say Israeli today. I think that's nothing more than an attempt to deny the truth of Scripture. I wish they called them Israelites. But the only true Israelites among them are who? The elect. Amen. They are the ones that truly constitute Israel. Back yonder, during Paul's day, during this day, and even in the future. Amen. Secondly... Being a part of Israel does not demand being a purebred Israelite. Exactly. Did you know that? Amen. This is seen in two ways. As we see it from Matthew chapter 1 verse 5, mainly the first part of the verse, who was Boaz's mammy? That's right. Now it may have been his great grandmother. There may be names left out. I'm not here to argue all that or try to debate that. That's not the point. But you go back and look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Yes, if you take it to mean literally, you know, generation by generation, who was Boaz's mother? Yeah. Amen. Anybody know? Anybody want to say? Rahab. Now, Joe, let me preach this. <laughs> Rahab was not an Israelite, no. was she? No. Not only was she not an Israelite, she wasn't even a good Gentile. That's right. She was a whore. And yet she is brought into the root stock of Israel and, and is then declared to be a, gene, a part of the genealogy of the Jewish ancestry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Correct? Amen. So she was an Israelite. Yeah. Was she not? Yeah. Huh? She was an Israelite. But even spiritually, as we men sometimes say, Romans chapter 11, verse 17. And I've I got to read that one because I, I can't quote it. Romans chapter 11, and let me read that verse. 
Verse 17, And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being what? Being a what? A wild olive tree. I'm, even if I am one of God's elect, I am never a natural olive branch. If I'm, one of the, if I'm a Gentile, even if I'm a, an elect, I'm still called what? A wild olive branch. Yeah. Amen. Not a natural olive branch. But who's Paul writing to now? People like Rahab back then? She became Jewish, didn't she? She began to practice what the Jews practiced. Live like the Jews lived. You see what I'm saying? But Paul here is talking to who? Gentiles. But in particular who? Believing Gentiles. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, wert grafting in among who? The natural branches, the ones that remain, be grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Amen. So let the premillennialist, though I myself am one, let them decry there is an absolute distinction between Israel and the church. I say they are wrong. You're right. But for the amillennialist, of which I am not one, who wants to say that the only thing is just being elect, and if you're an elect Gentile, then you're really spiritual Israel, you're wrong too. Because you're still a wild olive branch, but you have been so grafted in that you partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Amen. Now, why do I say that? Because that's my opinion. No. That's what I've just read to you. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. I, I've explained 2,000 years of eschatological argument. Yeah, exactly. How? By quoting a scripture. Exactly. Right there it is. Yeah. Point three. The point is this. Now here's the real point. The point is this. Look at chapter 12 and the context. Remember, verses 1 through 5 set the scene for and depict the spirit of what will happen even though it may be a couple thousand years in the future of what takes place between Satan and Israel on the earth in a time to come. The point is this. Satan's primary wrath is not toward God's people, but it is towards God's Christ. You see that? Look at it. Chapter 12, verse 4. And the tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth, and looked. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. Why? Here's the point. For to devour her child as soon as it was born. Exactly. You see that? Oh, yeah. Right. Satan wanted Christ dead. Exactly. Right? You could go back to Matthew mm -hmm. chapter 2, verses 1 through 18, and see this described vividly. Yes, sir. But note when you do that, that it wasn't Satan personally doing this. Yeah. What did he use? As a matter of fact, there we find him using one individual whose name was Herod. Yeah. Right. And he decided through all of his calculations and, well, he actually had other people calculate for him. That's the way most politicians do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's another message. Yeah. And when they come up with their calculations, they say, well, this was somewhere around two years ago. So what did he say? Kill every male child two years and under. According to Revelation 12, verses 1 through 5, that was Satan doing that. Yes, sir. But we see it manifested forth in human government, even in a human leader. Yes, sir. Do you see that? Is it any wonder then you find in verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, a great red dragon. And what did this red dragon have? Seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Yes, sir. You see that? Yeah. Now let me say to you this, and I know this, you know, no, it's not going to need further explaining. It might get me in trouble, but so be it. It got some in trouble back then. Yeah. All human government is under satanic influence. Yeah, sir. But at the same time, all human government is ordained of God. Amen. 
And that's just the way it is. That's exactly it. And although it's under satanic influence, at the same time it says, submit yourselves therefore. Yes, sir. But let me point out this. The scripture says, up to a point. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? That's, it. That's the way it presents it. Yeah. Up to a point. Now, I've made the point. Satan's primary wrath is not toward God's people, it's toward God's Christ. You, we've seen that manifested. And the great red dragon will one day be cast out of heaven. Remember, even in Job's day, he had access, right? And that access still, even according to the New Testament, seems to still be there. Right? Because he's even then still called, during this time, the prince of the power of the air. And our battle's not with flesh and blood. Now, he's not saying flesh and blood's not in this thing. But it's not the spirit of it's not the inst what is it? It's against principalities and powers against spiritual darkness in the where? The heavenlies. But one day God will say, Enough's enough, and he will cast him out where? To the ground. Right to the ground, yeah, to the earth. Now here's the point. Let me say it again. Satan's primary wrath is not toward God's people, but against God's Christ. His wrath is against God's people because God has identified himself with them. And, and only does it begin to come to a head against God's people when they begin to and continue to identify with God, his Christ, his gospel, and his people. Satan's not out attacking the elect merely as the elect. He don't know who they are any more than I do. Exactly. He's not omniscient. You know? Satan attacks God's people when God's people are brought by his grace to identify themselves with God. Amen. That's when the trouble starts. Yeah. Now you ought to be able to see the point now. But just to remind us, Satan, Satan's wrath is often indirect. Remember what happened to Job? Now God said, if you consider my servant Job, yeah. and Satan basically said, yeah, but I can't touch him. Right? right? Yeah. Satan said, I want to. Oh, yeah. I've been thinking about him, but you won't let me touch him. You put a hedge about him. Yeah. God said, all right, I'll take the hedge down. Yeah. Do whatever you want, but you can't have his life. Now what happens? What happened? Did Satan come down and just start causing all kinds of havoc? No, the Sabians came along. Exactly. Remember that? Yeah. Do you see the satanic influence? Who was the instigator of it? Satan was. Who was the author? No, uh oh. Am I should I say who was the author of it? God was. Amen. Because God brought Job's sub the subject of Job up. God was the author of all this. Yes, sir. God set the bounds. Did he not? Yeah. Now, come on now. Did he not? Yes, sir. Satan then is the instigator, the one who actually wants the bad to happen, but he doesn't do it himself. Yeah. He uses other things to do it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. That's exactly. Right? This is no new thing, and it's no new thing then. It's no new thing now. As I said before when I started this, man since the fall has always and will always be the same until either his final doom or ultimate glory in, in, in heaven yeah. or with Christ. Yeah. Therefore, Christ summed it up this way. It's the way Christ put it. If the world hated me, yeah. you know that it hated me before it hated you. And why does it hate you? Because I've chosen you, not just chosen you. Yeah. Yeah, he chose us, but he chose us how? Out of the world. And that's when the proverbial stuff begins to hit the fan. Exactly. Is when God Almighty's election comes to its fruition and he brings you by that election out of the world. That's when the world, under satanic influence, will begin to attack you. Amen. It doesn't attack you. Well, here's a, here's a question. Here's the thing. All we know about, oh, think about it. Christ's blood redemption, as I said, is not an end. It's the foundation and the fountain of continued grace. 
If God Almighty saved you by the cross, he's going to let you know about it by the preaching of the gospel. Yes, sir. And you're going to begin to identify with that gospel that you hear preached and those people that are preaching it and those who are believing it. Yes, sir. That's the way it happens. And when that happens, then satanic attack will come down. But it may not be Satan himself. It may be the government. It may be society in general. It may be the economic system of the world. Whatever it might be. But it's still all where? It's from that red dragon who's got the crowns up here. The heads, the heads and the crown, isn't it? Now here's the thing. <coughs> It's easy for us to often talk about, well, we can overcome the enemy. Who's the enemy? Well, the government's the enemy. You know, or society in general's the enemy, yeah. right? Or the economic system in general is the enemy. And you know what? That's all true. Yeah. That's all true. But who did Christ? Christ even made it more personal, didn't he? Yes, sir. Turn to it, Matthew chapter 10, and that's where we're just going to park for the rest of my remaining time. Who, Christ made it more personal. Who did Christ say a man's enemies would be? Exactly. Yeah. It's easy for me to talk about them out yonder, the government up in Washington or West Virginia. You know what I'm saying. And somebody said, you're damning them all to hell. No, God Almighty is the one who damns men and women to hell. But it's easy to talk about the government or the economic system or the, our society in general. Christ said a man's foes will be who? Those of his own household. Amen. It's not just out there, brothers and sisters. It's right here amidst your flesh and blood. Yes, sir. That's where the most problem is. Yeah. Washington hadn't come after me yet. Yeah. Now I said yet. I don't know whether they will. A little peanut preacher like me in Crow, West Virginia with 25 people preaching to and a few CDs going out. They ain't come after me yet, David. But that don't mean they won't. They ain't come after you yet. That don't mean they won't. But it's easy to talk about that, ain't it? Yeah. But when it hits where? Home. That's it. When it hits home, that's when it's tough. That's when it, as the old saying is, that's when the rubber hits the road. And that's where you begin to find out who, who true disciples are, and are or not. Because yes, yes, we overcome him. Who? Satan. Yeah. But manifest where? Yeah. Even sometimes in your own family members. Yes, sir. That's we overcome him. How? By the blood of the lamb. But what else? Yeah. And by the word of their testimony. Yeah. And what else? And love not your life. How far? Even unto the death. Amen. Now Christ said, look at it, verse 36 of Matthew 10, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Amen. Now think about what I'm just going to say. When God saves you, when God saved you, think of, think of it. When God saved you, when he began to fill your heart and mind with light, the light of the gospel and you begin to understand you began to understand what you are as corrupt and fallen and depraved in his sight and you began to see some of the glories of the Lord Jesus Christ did the world automatically just jump on and say we hate you no they didn't even know that was happening exactly we didn't even some some of us didn't know what was happening right. did we right. we didn't understand it the world don't see that but what do they see? Why is it that a man's foes will be they of his own household? Look at what he says. Verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men. Exactly. And who's the people you're around most of the time? Exactly. That's it. Those of your own household. Yeah. Those you were born around. That's it. Rode up with. Yeah. Live around, right? Whosoever thou shalt confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. That is when the trouble starts. It's when you begin to start to identify yourself with that Jesus Christ. That's when you start to see family members turn. Right? But remember, yeah, there it is, by the word of their testimony. Right? Isn't that what he's talking about right there? 
Huh? But what else does it say? They love not their lives even unto the death. Now look, but whosoever, that's the same whosoever. And actually means everyone who or everyone that. The word whosoever is okay. But whosoever shall what? Deny me before men. Him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Amen. Let me tell you, the people that were my enemy when this thing first started out, when God Almighty first brought me to identify myself with the Lord Jesus Christ, they are still my enemies today, even though time seems to have calmed things down a little. Those people still hate me and my God and his Christ and his gospel just as much today as they did back 30 years ago. Amen. Yes, sir. And I tell you what, we have to confess him just as much today as we did by him back then. Amen. Yes, sir. Now, let me say this, because this, hits the, this, this comes down to where we live, yes, brothers and sisters. This comes down to where we, we, we realize who's the enemy and who's our friend. Exactly. Right? Yeah. This is what it's about when it comes down to living the Christian life. Yeah. There, as our Lord says in chapter 10 here, verse 32 and 33, there must be, there must be identification with Christ. Yes, sir. There must be. That's right. Amen. Now, see, you can't prove to them what God did for you. But it will then come out on you once he has done that for you. And you will begin to, you won't be able to help yourself. I must identify with him. Why? Because he's worthy of that. He's worthy of it. You know? Lord God, my next message is the finality of the Lamb. Look what it's going to be like in eternity. What? The Lamb. The Lamb. The Lamb. The Lamb. The Lamb's the light. The Lamb's the tabernacle. The Lamb's the life. He's that today, too. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. If he's not that important now, you think all of a sudden it's going to, he's going to be that important to you then? Yeah. No, they overcame him how? By the blood of the Lamb. That's the foundation. But what else, and by the word of their testimony, but it's not just a one-time or a couple-year thing, and they love not their lives. How long? Unto the death. Amen. Even if it means family members hate you for it. Now this does not excuse us from governmental responsibilities, does it? This does not excuse us from social responsibilities. This does not excuse us. It does not negate filial, maternal, or paternal responsibilities. That's right. You remember, the Pharisees, they didn't like Christ anyway. Yeah, exactly. Now, there was another group of folks called the Herodians. We're actually not told much about them, but what they seemed to have been was a bunch of Jews who really liked being under Rome. Yeah. Because for them, things were a lot better under Rome yeah. than what they knew about their ancestors when they were under theocracy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Now, theocracy for a believer is the greatest thing. But for sophisticates, you know, the social folks, even if they're Jews, they call them Herodians in our days. I call them by another name, but I can't say it because it'll go on tape and I'll be accused of cussing. But anyway, they still exist today. What happened? The Pharisees sent their followers to get the Herodians to go ask Jesus, here, here's a coin. Whose inscription's on it? Or no, here's a coin. You know, what do you do about Caesar? That's what they asked. And Jesus, it says Jesus knew what they were doing. Yes, sir. He said, give me the coin. Yeah. He gave them the coin, he looked at it, and he turned it to him and said, whose inscription's on this? I said, Caesar's. He said, render therefore unto Caesar then the things that are Caesar's. But what else? Yes, sir. What did he add that wasn't on that coin? That's right. Render unto God the things that are God's. Amen. God does not negate our responsibility to people in this world. But be careful that you don't misunderstand <laughs> that responsibility or you don't twist that responsibility to the denial of the gospel and the people of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Because denying is not just 
saying, I don't believe that, it's keeping your mouth shut when you ought to speak up. That's what it's about. Because you remember what happened. <laughs> the king came to that gal called Rahab and said, where are they at? Right? This is the king. What'd she do? She lied about it. Right? She lied about it. And yet the scripture in the New Testament calls that an act of faith. Amen. Doesn't it not? Yes, sir. Yes, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But you better remember the superior thing is render unto God the things that are God's. Amen. One man, when Christ said, follow me. He said, well, let me go home and bury my daddy first. That's, that, that's, that's a paternal responsibility, isn't it not? Yeah. Right? Right. But what did Christ tell him? Let the dead bury the dead. Wake up! Let the dead bury the dead. Yes, sir. Which relationship, which identification is more important? Exactly. Hmm? Yeah. Now, wait, well, but I identify with Christ. That's right. Now look, look. He didn't stop there. Look, verse 37, we see it. He that loveth father and mother, what? More than me, what? Is not worthy of me. And he that loveth, what does it say? Son or daughter. That's as personal as you can get. Yes, sir. Wait a minute, not quite. But almost. Yeah. Now look. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross... What? His cross. And followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. Amen. But he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Now there it's as personal as it can get. Yes, sir. Right? Yeah. Because listen, even my life in this world is my enemy. Yes, sir. The things of this world, the recognition of this world, the, 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 the accompaniments of this world, the, the, the ease of this world, right? The money of this world, the social standing of this world, it don't mean squat when Christ is all. Yeah. Right? That's it. Well, boy, I believe all that, and I'm going to just go crawl up in my little corner, and I'm going to believe that for the rest of my life. Is that where it ends at? Look what else it says. He that receiveth you receiveth me. Amen. So wait a minute, there's some, it goes even further now. This ain't just personal, is it? No. Not only do I say I believe the Christ of God, and this may even turn family members against me. Huh? Oh, yeah. It may even turn family members against me. But what I've got to do is also turn against myself. Exactly. But, in turning from those things, turning to Christ, I also turn to who else? Yeah. Come on now, yeah. who else? Yeah. God's people. Yeah. Amen. They mean more than anybody else. Yeah. Right. Even myself. Exactly. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Yeah. Amen. Do you see the association there? You can't ever break that chain and say, well, I'm okay. Yeah. I made my start, but I'll stop right here and just idle for a while. Yeah. You can't idle. Yeah. Not if that idol is denial. Exactly. Yeah. Now, hear what I said. Not if that idol is denial. And sometimes denial is just by keeping your mouth shut. Yeah, there's a time to keep your mouth shut. That is not to cast your pearls before swine. But let me tell you something. Somebody asks you where you stand, or you know the, the reason, the, 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 not the opportunity, you know that that door is there, then stand up for who you believe in. Yes, sir. And stand with who you stand with. That's right. And stand with them to the denial of all others. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Now look, he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man. It ain't just about preachers, is it? Yeah. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give a drink to one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple. Verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. This was mentioned the other day by an individual. 
And it didn't dawn on me. But it has now. Be careful. Be careful how you associate with the world, even if it's your own flesh and blood. Because you send mixed signals to other believers as to what's going on. And especially new, born believers in Christ. I remember when the people at New Zion rejected me. And what I stood for and who I identified with. And it wasn't just me. It was some of the rest of you. And you know what? Those people hate my God just as much today as they ever did. Things ain't got better. They've just gotten quieter. Exactly. But you let me walk into their midst one time and begin to acknowledge my Lord one more time and you see what happens. That's exactly right. We've had people in this assembly come to this assembly and profess to be believers and turn from it in no uncertain terms. Be careful how you associate with those people. They will drag you down because scripture says evil communication does what? Corrupts good manners. Yes, sir. Who you identify with is manifest in who you associate with. Isn't that what that right there says? Yeah. That's what it says. That's why the scripture says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Yeah. But you know what? All you got to do is acknowledge him yeah. and it'll happen. They'll yeah. kick you out. Amen. Yes, sir. You don't have to worry. How am I going to do it? Just start speaking about his splendors again. Yes, Just start honoring and glorifying his gospel again and see what's happened. Those people will get rid of you like a hot potato. Yes, sir. Hmm? That's right. It ain't got better. And as a matter of fact, turn to the Revelation, read it again. It's just going to be manifestly worse exactly. as time goes on. Scripture says those that will live godly in this world shall suffer persecution. Yes, sir. Now living godly is not being a great moral person. Living godly is acknowledging God for who he is. Amen. That's what living godly is. It's godliness. Not godlikeness, godliness. God is all this glory and I praise him for it and I publicly acknowledge him as it. And let the chips fall where they may. Sadly, I've had my bouts with that. I thought I could go into the world and show the world that by nature I'm just like you world. You know, my God's got gracious grace. Yeah, that's right. But even I at times can forget that he said, yeah, I come to save sinners. He did. He said, I come not to call the righteous. But what? But to call sinners. Where? Where? To repentance. Yeah, exactly. Let me tell you, all they see, if you begin to do like Peter, deny the Lord, all they see is my cowardice and your cowardice. Let it be that we stand up and say, I stand with this God. I stand with his Christ. I stand with that Christ gospel. And I stand with those who believe that gospel. Amen, and if you don't like that, I don't care. There was a time when I felt that way about things. May God Almighty keep that real in my heart. Mason, even if the zeal ain't quite as zealous today, may it still be the same zeal. Because let me tell you something. They overcame him. How? By the blood of the Lamb. By the word of their testimony. And what else? And love not their lives. How far? How long? Unto the death. That's right. That's right. Scripture is quite clear. These all died in faith. Amen. You know, I don't care how well you start. Yeah. Yeah. It ain't a matter how well you start. It's a matter of where I am right now today. And it'll be a matter of where I die when I die. Yeah. That's what it's going to be a matter of. You know? It's a matter of, us. It's a matter yeah. as Henry Mahan said, it's identification. Who do you identify with? Yes, sir. Even if it causes me loss. Yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah. Even if it causes me loss. And that's just the way it is. Because you can talk about blood, you can talk about Christ's redemption, you can talk the doctrine all day long, but that doctrine comes to manifestation in a person's life and the way they live, they think, and they believe. Amen. I remember a time when there were certain people I didn't want to be around. You know why? Because I knew how much they hated my Lord. Yeah. Yes, sir. I knew how uncomfortable they made me feel. Yeah. Oh, God, don't let that ever go away from me. Exactly. You know why? 
Because, I, you know, two cannot walk together except what? Except they cannot. Except they be agreed. So if you can walk with them, guess what? You agree with them. Exactly. Is that not what the book is saying? It's what it's saying. But if you can walk with God's people, Amen. if you can walk with his gospel and with his Christ, guess who you agree with? Amen. God. Amen. God. Father, <coughs> may, be, may these things ever be before us because we are so dull, so faulty. <coughs> we can be so lazy. We can be so fearful. But Lord, that same grace, as our beloved Apostle Paul has said, that you, that have begun a good work in us, you will continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. Lord, we must rest upon that because that's our only hope. And I thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen.